Uh, this is John Buck back for another video talking about discrete time system properties. Uh, and in this video, we're going to talk about the property of causality. That is, when is a system uh, something we can build that runs in real time? Uh, so in this video, I'll tell you what the definition of causality is. And then we'll also look at uh, how do you prove whether or not a system is causal or not. I'll show you a few examples and, and a process you can go through to figure out if, if a system given by an equation is causal. Okay, so switching uh, over to our whiteboard here. Again, the system, the topic for today is causality. And again, this is part of a series we're talking about five important properties for systems, linearity, time invariance, causality, stability, and invertibility. And this is, is uh, causality is the focus of this video. There are other videos uh, for the first four. I haven't made a video for invertibility yet, but we don't talk about it too much in this class. It is an important property, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but not right from the right off the bat. Um, so that's why, uh, just to be clear, there's, there's videos for the first four properties here. Uh, so when we say a system is causal, what we mean is that the present value of the output depends on the input values for the present and earlier times. We're saying that it, another way, it means the system can't read the output doesn't depend on the input in the future. It only depends on now and the past. And so if I were going to build a real system, that has to be the way, right? I can't build a real system that knows the future. If I could build that system, I would be making gazillions of dollars in Vegas or on the stock market, not making videos about discrete time linear systems for YouTube. Right, but so for a specific example, if like n equals four, that means the output y of four only depends on x of n for n less than or equal to four, right? So it can only depend on the current or earlier, the input for current or earlier time indices. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Let's see how we use that in practice. So here's an example. The output y of n is equal to x squared of, of n, x of n squared plus three x of n minus two. And uh, so again, what we're looking at is again, looking at that definition, we say is the output time index here. Then we look at the inputs. So the inputs are coming from x of n and n minus two. So if it's causal, to be causal, we need, right, that the output time index, which here is n, has to be always uh, less, I'm sorry, greater than or equal to the input time index or indices, all of them, if there's more than one term. So we need x, we need the output at time n. We've got n and n minus two on this side. Now it turns out that one's pretty easy to show. That's always true, right? Right, so this is a very simple example to start out, but since this is the out, you know, again, these are the input time indices. So these are from inside the brackets. And this is the output part. And so this tells me the output at time n depends on the input at n and n minus 2, which are always less than that. Right? So I guess to set this up, sort of the key question for causality is, is this true? And here it is true. So we can say, yes, that's true. So this tells me the system is causal. Going to uh, another example, we could say, what about y of n is equal to x of 2 minus n. So again, the key question is, is the output time index greater than or equal to the input time indices, right? Because if that's true, that means the output now only depends on current and earlier versions of the input. So if I go up here now and look, I can say, well, here's the output in, is, is n the input time index is two minus n. So this question is, causality is equivalent to saying, is n greater than or equal to two minus n? Right, so it's the output now always on earlier current or earlier versions. And so if I solve this equation, I'll add n to both sides, I'll get two n greater than two. Is n always greater than or equal to one? Well, no, right? this is not true for all n. So this means this system is not causal. And in fact, we've, we've seen this in class already, right? This is the system that flips the input and then delays it by two, right? We saw in class, we could also write this as x. We could factor the minus sign out 
and write it like this. And say, well, when I break it down that way, I can see that this is a system that flips the input, then delays by two. Uh, and so flips are usually a good sign that things aren't causal. Having something flip is usually a good sign that it's not going to be causal. Uh, so this is the step-by-step -step approach. We can also very quickly show this isn't true using something called a counterexample. Now for a counterexample, we can just pick one example and show that it breaks the property. Right? So if I say n equals 0, then when n, when n equals 0, I'm saying I've got y of 0 is equal to x of 2 minus 0, which is x of 2. But now, now I'm looking to say, well, the output now is looking two samples into the future. That's not causal. right? This is looking into the future. So again, that just confirms it's not causal. So maybe this, this is a good point to mention uh, before we go on. Proof strategies for system for system properties. There's, there's sort of it's, it's not quite the same. When things are true, if a property is true, the only way you can prove it is true is this step-by-step -step process. You need this step-by-step -step process to say this is going to work all the time for every input, every output, at every time. You cannot just use examples to prove something is always true. You know, in practice, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I plug a few examples in to get a sense, to get some intuition, saying, "Oh, I tried three examples, and it all the property always held." That's a good chance that it's true, but that's not a proof. That tells me, well, now maybe I should spend the time to try to prove it, because if I plug one one example in and it breaks it, well, then I know if I've got one example where the property doesn't hold then it's false. So that brings us to the second point here. There are two ways to show something isn't false. right? If I want to prove something isn't false, I can go step by step like we started on the last pro problem and show that the property breaks down. Show that we cannot say that, that like we did on the, the last slide, if we hop back there, right? n is not greater than or equal to 1 for all n. You can have n0 and negative numbers. So, so if I go step by step, I'll get the answer. But also, if I'm just trying a few examples, I might get lucky show find one example that says oh this property doesn't hold here's an example that proves it's not true and that's called the counter example right so that that makes it break down and that's what i showed second on the last slide so going down uh one one more example here's y of n is equal to x of n cubed so again it's inside the time brackets brackets i'm cubing the time and again if i'm not sure i could again just try an example and it will turn out i can find a counter example quickly so suppose I say, let's look at n equals 2. Well, then I'm saying the output at time 2 is equal to the input at time 2 cubed, which is x of 8. And very quickly, you can say, oh, that's not causal. All right? So this is another case that because the property is not true, just by plugging in an example, I can break it and say, oh, that's not true. It isn't going to work. I could also do it step by step, though, right? I can again. I can say is the output. If I don't see the example, I can just go back and say, well, is the output time index always greater than or equal to all the input time indexes? Right. So then that's saying n is greater than or equal to is n greater always than or equal to n cubed for for all the values here. And so I could divide both sides of this equation by 1 and say, well, is, is n squared always less than 1? No, there's a lot of n's where n squared is greater than 1. The 2 I just had above, 3, 4, uh, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, all those would, would also still have, have problems here, right? So, I, uh, so in, th in this case, I'm just pausing as I say that. Actually, the minus 1s are a bad case because if n is minus... Uh, that was a bad example to pick. So if if n is positive, I can divide both sides by n and get this equation and prove that it doesn't work, right? So I've already proved it's not causal. Not causal. But if I, I, I should have been more careful, as if 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 n is less than zero, when I divide both sides by n, I got to flip the inequality, right? And then for for all the negative integers, this would be true. 
So this is an example that some people might say, well, it's causal for negative time. No such thing. Can't have it. It's either always causal or, or not causal. So, so this is still, even though it's, even though this holds, this is true for negative integers. So you might be fooled at first. You have to go over here and look and say, ah, but it doesn't work for positive integers and you can't be causal sometimes. You either never know the future or you sometimes know the future and that means you're not causal, not strictly causal. Okay, so there's there's some examples of definition of causality and some examples of how to prove it. Again, here's my, my uh, closing credits if, if anybody wants to, to look up more about our department, my research program. Uh, there are some useful links here. And uh, that's it on uh, causality. I'll see you next time on the next video.